one of the things I think is really interesting about this problem, though, is when, when you talked about it on your, your, your podcast, the, the issue of overproduction. There's a lot of people out there that almost create a market for what they do. I feel like Frank Payne is a great example. He'll get a species, and before he's offering it to anybody, he's doing all these really cool marketing bits on that species. And like, I find myself going like, oh man, I want that now. Yeah. And, and he creates a market for what he's doing. Overproduction is one thing. I think the other side of it is the breeder taking responsibility for that legwork. Do you market what you're working on so that when you're done, people are there waiting for you so that you can work with them and make sure that what you're doing has a place? Today, there's so many ways for you to get out there and talk to people and find people who are in Alaska or you know, whatever it is, find people who have a similar passion to you and then help make sure that what you're doing has, has a place in the market. So, Welcome back to the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan Perrin, and thank you so much for tuning in today. Today, I'm speaking with Jonathan Hill, who is the owner and operator of the Panther Chameleon breeding operation, iPredalis. Now, this is another conversation that was sparked by my solo episode that I released back in December, and that was the episode where I discussed the ethics of keeping and ethics of herpeticulture in general and Jonathan's messaged me and we got back to talking back and forth and I realized this would be a perfect guest to have on the ep- on the podcast and so in the episode we discuss he Jonathan lays out and sort of paints a picture of the breeding operation that he has right now he is one of the most thorough chameleon breeders I've ever come across. He has incredible enclosures. He goes to great lengths to make sure he's doing things ethically and properly. For him, the care of the animal comes first, the business comes second, and it's very apparent when you listen to him talk. So he lays out the landscape of what he's working with and of course how he got into chameleon breeding and whatnot. But then we hit off on five or six different topics that were sort of directly chameleon related but are also I think transferable to other areas of the hobby as well. And these are specific ethical questions when it comes to keeping and breeding chameleons. So the first one was something that I had never even thought about before was selling eggs, selling fertilized eggs. That's it is something that happens in the chameleon world. So Jonathan talks about why that's probably not a great idea. We did talk about uh, raising babies, the issue with raising chameleon babies. They are quite vicious and when they're kept in groups, but although that is the common practice to raise babies in groups, so we, we discuss the, the issues with that. We discuss wild caught and importation. We discuss breeding and flipping. We talk about genetics in general, specifically with chameleons, with panther chameleons, all of those phenotypic traits, the colors that are displayed on their bodies on the males anyway. These are all polygenetic polygen- traits. It's not as simple as recessive and dominant traits like you might see on a ball python for example so jonathan talks about how that has influenced the market he also leaves some incredibly interesting tidbits of information for you if you want to become a breeder somehow you can help market yourself and market the product that you're creating or the animals that you are creating and we also talk about parasites and the importance of making sure you do have a clean collection or when you should have a clean collection when it comes to you know doing fecal scans and whatnot, and when you can kind of maybe get away with not having to worry too much. Again, this is insights that I've not heard shared on the show before, so it's super valuable information. Even if you are not a chameleon person, this is an episode that you will find absolutely fascinating, so I do hope you enjoy. If you're looking for more information on this episode, make sure you head to animalsathomenetwork.com. There you'll find the show notes for all the episodes that have been recorded to date. Thank you so much to Custom Reptile Habitats for sponsoring this podcast. Behind me are my Custom Reptile Habitat enclosures. As you all know, there are currently a couple other ones that I will be building, and I need to finish off the two that are not quite finished. That will happen. It's just going to take me some time. If you are looking for any new reptile related equipment make sure you head to the affiliate link in either the show notes or the youtube description that is an affiliate link like i said so if you do make a purchase a commission comes back to me at no extra cost to you which of course helps support the show another way you can support the show is through patreon at patreon.com animals at home 
The Patreon members are what allow this the podcast to be produced on a monthly basis. They do cover the editing fees. We're so close to 100 patrons. I would love to get there in the next couple of months. So if you are interested in joining us there, you can do that. And the added bonus is you do get access to the Discord, which means you get to have conversations with the other listeners as well. And of course, get invited to some Keepers chat and whatnot. Uh, there's a lot there. So make sure you go check that out. And if you are interested in a Animals at Home sweater or t-shirt, you can do that at animalsathome.ca slash shop. $5 does get automatically donated to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy. And probably the easiest way you can help support the show is simply by sharing it on social media. Let's jump into the episode. Enjoy. Awesome. Well, Jonathan, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. This is another episode of the podcast that's kind of sparked by the the solo episode I recorded at the end of last year. And we started chatting in the DMs. And again, it was like, boom, I need to have you on and just have this conversation so other people can kind of learn from it. And because you have a, a lot of experience that I don't have. So I want to kind of pick your bain, brain in those areas. Why don't we paint a little picture for people just Give us an idea of what you are up to right now, what your breeding operation looks like, the species you're working with. Kind of paint us a picture there, and then then we're going to rewind the clock. I want to get to how you got to where you are, but let's give everybody an idea of of what it's like right now. So I'm focused primarily on uh, Amblobe panther chameleons, so one specific local form of uh, panther chameleons. And uh, I have a small project of first for minor, uh, lesser chameleons. Um, as well as I've had colibrid snakes my entire life. So I'm, I'm pretty sure they will be with me when I die. Mm -hmm. Um, and I love those guys. So I've got, I've got some, some corn snakes that I bred when I was six years old that are still with me. And, wow. but for, for, but as far as, as far as the Iperdalis project, um, it's primarily Ambalobe panther chameleons. And, and, and how many animals are you working with? Like I just looked behind you, there's amazing planted enclosures behind you and it looks like you have quite a quite a setup. Yeah, so these are some of my newest enclosures where I worked with uh I got some from Dale Tamora um where he's got wind on a on a schedule, um UVB basking all on separate schedules along with fog at night, um a mist schedule for rain. Um, so it's pretty, these are my most advanced enclosures and, um, really sophisticated stuff that, that Dale put together. Um, and that I've been, I've been really en enjoying. And, and like, I, I started to use these because I hadn't done much with fog and I was trying, I wanted to have a good example of like, how do you do it, uh, on a small scale before taking it to the whole room? Because I often have this thing where it's like, I know I want to do it. I know it's good for the animals but how do I do it safely and how do I do it the right way? And so usually I start small. I'll start with, you know, a one rack at a time or one group of uh, adult breeders, get it dialed in and then try to scale it to, to the rest of the animals. Cause I've got probably now at any given time, depending on how many are hatching and, and leaving me, I'm usually caring for about 150 to 200 panther chameleons. Wow. Um, so that it's like, okay, well, you can't, I can't just take fog to the entire room at once. I've got to get it dialed in, get comfortable with it and then say, okay, what makes sense to, to go kind of one rack, one rack at a time around the room and add it. Yeah. So, yeah. well, and that's the, 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 the problem with fog is how cool it looks, <laughs> you know, like it's just so tempting to just like blast everything with fog because it's such a, it's an awesome effect, but yeah. yeah, you do have to be careful, make sure you're getting the ventilation in, not overusing it, not cooking them by making like a steam bath type situation. So there's a lot of nuance there. Exactly. Yeah. And so, um, th that's the kind of approach that I've had throughout the project is, is start small, try to learn something, feel comfortable with it, then scale it. Um, and so I did start with one pair of panther chameleons in 2015. I got one hold back from that whole clutch. I let go of everything except for one male. Um, and then I got two females and, and kind of slowly built up to where I am now. Um, and, uh, that's, that's kind of been my approach. So it's like, whether it be the scaling of the size of the project or scaling on a specific aspect of what I'm trying to do from a husbandry standpoint, I always like to do that. Like start small, figure it out and then, and then take it to the rest. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I mean, when I look at the enclosures behind you with this you know, super well planted, like we've already talked about, you know, 
the yeah. lighting and whatnot. And I, I can't imagine how much work it is. Like you don't want to be thrown into a hundred plus chameleons. There's just so much, but, but keeping, no even doing what you're doing now, this must be a tremendous amount of work. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a, at least a part-time job. Yeah. Not more. As you said, you, you started with the, the two, what, what got you into that species to begin with? Did you already, were you already keeping panthers as a as a pet and then you were kind of intrigued by them or how, how did you get that first pair my it was actually it was my wife and i we got our place um we had been living in a an apartment and then when we got uh, a, a house then um i i we were trying to figure out like what is the first species that we can add outside of our dog we got a dog and then um chameleons were something we found we both were interested in and um i had grown up with colorbreds, but had never been able to work with chameleons um, because w- in the early 90s, uh, we didn't really know what we were doing. And when I talked to Ange at Reptile Showcase, where I grew up, he advised me not to get them. He said, we don't really know how to keep them alive very long. They're very expensive, et cetera. And so I just, he kind of end routed me, went to my mom and told me, told, said, no, you guys can't get these yet. So... <laughs> Um, I had been waiting years to have the opportunity to try to get back into it, try to figure it out. And when we got our place, uh, that was pretty close to when Bill started his Chameleon Academy podcast. I had been listening to that um, pretty much from the beginning. And so so that's when we, we made the choice. We said, hey, you like chameleons. I like chameleons. I've always wanted to be able to uh, work with them. And, and so we had a lot of things come together. To... Did, did you start with the pair? Yep. Oh, you did. So you had intentions of breeding kind of that, that was a project you were going to start. Yeah, I think I pretty, I pretty, maybe it's a, I, I, I know we've, you've talked about it on your podcast, but I come, I've always bred my reptiles and that was something that I liked about what, what like people have been talking about more recently is should we be doing that? But like, it's been a big part of herpetoculture for me is breeding, whether it be colorbred snakes, um, you name it. That's always, that's always kind of been a part of the interest that I've had is whether like understanding their genetics, understanding what you're going to get from different combinations of, of animals. And, um, so yeah, I, from the beginning was always curious about the breeding aspect of, of, of keeping them. So yeah. Well, and it seems like you have, you know, this was kind of sparked our conversation in the in our DMs on Instagram was you have a very conscientious mindset when it comes to breeding. Like you are very, you're all in, you want to make sure all the, the T's are crossed, the I's are dotted and whatnot. And yeah. I mean, that's a challenge in itself. Is that, is that how you've always been? Have you always been, I want to make sure I'm doing everything ethically and properly? When I was younger, I didn't have the means to. Mm-hmm. So I would say when I, when I bred my first uh, corn snakes, which I have right now, um, I don't think that I, I was prepared. And so I, it was very difficult to find homes for them. And that's part of why I still have a couple of them now. Um, <laughs> hey, that's a good and, commitment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's like, well, I guess Stubby's going to be with us forever. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I have, he, you know, Stubby's upstairs and, uh, he, I've, I've, I've learned a lot from chameleons to share with my colorbreds. So now I've, been getting them into more sophisticated naturally planted enclosures with lights and one thing i thought i found really cool from a behavior standpoint is we always hydrate our chameleons with water on leaves right Mm -hmm. and one thing i realized immediately with my colorbreds is when i put them in one of those enclosures they drink water off leaves too and that's really cool to watch like i love misting my colorbreds like i have a black rat snake and a giant by varium with with leaves and stuff and i'll miss it and he goes around drinking all the droplets off the leaves and i was like this is just awesome this is this is so cool to see um i think i posted a video of it right like the first time that i saw it but um that was an example of i'd worked with chameleons and i took it back to the colorbreds i'd had with me my whole life there's definitely a lot of that like back and forth learning and, and applying new ideas yeah, absolutely. As long as you stay open-minded, you can let one species guide your care for another species. There's just so much, especially when you're dealing with something that's totally different, like chameleons and, and you know, colubrids, North American colubrids versus chameleons. There's a lot of <laughs> span oh, yeah, between. <laughs> yeah, it's huge. It's very different. But um, that was something, at least in drinking, I, I was not aware that they would go and 
take all the droplets off leaves and things like that. That was pretty cool. Yeah, so. that's amazing. And, and so, what as as far as chameleon breeding goes, uh, you know, I guess as far as chameleon breeders go across the board, what, is there a spectrum as far as what some breed? Like, we'll get into more of these topics in depth in a little bit. But I'm just curious, like, what are some of the things that you're doing that that other breeders may not be doing? And there's not like a, an opportunity to say I'm better than everybody, but but we no. always have those moments and you know steps in the hobby. And I know you're doing a lot. So, what are some of those things? And, and maybe, maybe what what some of the worst case scenario as far as chameleon breeders go? Well, I think the worst case is there's this, there's a myth that um, solitary, what are solitary animals that do very well in individual enclosures like this as adults can be thrown in one enclosure as babies. Mm. Um, And that's false. It's just that they don't physically kill each other. Like if you put the two males in one enclosure, especially males that have never been in the same enclosure they're gonna get pretty close to a fight to the death the babies they just they establish some kind of hierarchy but there's a lot of stress involved with that especially depending on the amount of space and other things and so like the worst case i would say is when babies are being raised in large groups in one enclosure um and there's a a significant percentage that are just never going to get what they need they're not going to make it. And then often the conclusion is nature intended for this. Um, that that's why they have big clutch sizes is, is because, you know, only half of them are going to make it or, so, you know, whatever, whatever the uh, rationalization is um, for how many babies they're, lo- they're losing when doing that. Um, that's, I'd say, is probably the worst case is there's this idea that um, you can do it, you can get away with it. and um, and that it's the large clutch size is there for that reason. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas for, for years I was getting close to like 98% survival rates with individual enclosures. And so I could see very clearly the difference. Um, when you raise them all by themselves, they live, they don't die. Yeah. You know, they, they, they get all the food they need and they, uh, they grow faster and they reward you with the way that they look. So like, You'll often look around and I get this a lot of people either like not believing how old they are because I'll say, here's a three month old chameleon or here's a four month old chameleon. And the, the most common reaction I get from people is that's not that that can't be true. That that looks like a six month old or eight month old or even a year old when it's only six months old, um, because the chameleons that are raised individually hit an exponential growth path earlier. They grow faster. They color up better. Um, a lot of things because of their colors are polygenic. They're mm-hmm. not recessive or dominant traits where it's like, if that trait's there, you're going to see it. Polygenic traits are expressed differently depending on their environment. So if you give them good environment, they're going to express their trait to its fullest extent. And they're going to look, they will look better and um, potentially will look better their whole life. It's not just, a temporary thing. Right. So when you have a, a single enclosure full of a bunch of babies, they're not going to look good at all. They're probably going to be smaller too. I mean, I, I think something that comes yep. to my mind, just as you're saying that is something as simple as sleep. You know, if, if, if they are insanely stressed, it's either going to impact the animal's sleep or their ability to sleep at all because they got to you kind know, of watch around Constantly to make sure compete. they're not being, yeah. And just imagine how much growth and development happens when you have an animal that can properly sleep in a peaceful environment. Yep. And we were talking about the neuroplastic neuroplasticity on one of the more recent episodes that moment is important for them Mm -hmm. you know brain development behavioral uh things and 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 everything else there and one of the papers that i read early on i think it was in 2016 um was arguing that the babies raised in groups eat better um because they're trained to competitively eat Mm -hmm. so like if you get that alpha male out of a group and you have compare him to the alpha from the individuals the alpha in the individual enclosures he'll eat when he's hungry and he's not as likely to competitively eat and so you you result what what actually ends up happening is you have more issues with obesity from animals that have raised been raised in groups because they're trained their brain has developed in a way that's like if I see food, I got to get it because otherwise this guy on my left is going to get it. And so they're 
trained and their brain is trained to just eat all the time. Well, I, I mean, if you just think about it from a wild point of view, I mean, these animals are not going to be clustered together in the wild. As soon as they hatch, they're out they and about out. and, yep. and you know, they're probably going to become prey for something. But in captivity, we have the opportunity to make sure that they live. And, and so that does make a lot of sense. So are, are there any other weird things that chameleon breeders are kind of doing as a shortcut or and like I said, I want well, to get into some of the more specific things in a little bit, but are there any other yeah. ones that just uh, that are kind of simple? So another simple one is if they, they're selling eggs primarily because so for, for a long time, we've had this standard of three months old is the minimum age for Panther chameleons to be ready for a new home. And the reason is because they're more likely to crash and have an issue during that early period in their life when they're too young to to be with someone who doesn't really know panther chameleons, right? So we as breeders specialize in taking care of babies and making sure they have small food items and, and create micro environments for these little guys. The worst thing you can do is actually probably to ship a one week old chameleon, which is something that people do. Mm. Um, eggs are like a little better than that <laughs> in in that at least they hatch in the in the new place. They're not in that vulnerable state being shipped. Um, so the very worst is probably shipping a hatchling, and then right up right next to that is selling eggs because that means that they're going to be hatching out with an inexperienced keeper uh, versus someone who knows what they're doing uh, during that that vulnerable period of zero to three months of age. Yeah, I hadn't even heard of this until you had mentioned it to me. I didn't even realize that this was happening, that people were selling eggs. So when people sell eggs, are they sending them, or are, are they selling them when they are immediately laid or are they incubating them for a short, like, I mean, obviously that would break up the incubation if they're sending them half incubated or what's the deal? Well, chameleons are really interesting in that they, a lot of species have longer incubation periods and they have a, a long period where they're dormant. Um, like the egg is just, waiting for the right conditions to hatch and to start developing. And so there's certain certain kind of cues that we don't even fully understand um, that result in them starting to develop and then hatching. And so there's a period where they, the embryo isn't even developing much. It's just waiting. And during that waiting period, uh, that's when they'll often be shipped is... I, I don't believe there's, I mean, we have to test it, but I don't believe there's a huge impact because there's a lot of anecdotal stories of people moving their eggs around, the eggs being just fine. Um, I've I've had eggs get, like I have a two-year-old and a four-year-old and I've had them get a hold of eggs <laughs> and those have still hatched after um, the, the, they've gotten into my egg cupboard. I know that they're relatively stable th- during that period before the embryo starts to develop. And um, I think that's what people are taking advantage of when yeah. shipping eggs. I mean, I, I know I know chickens are the same way. You can collect a bunch of chicken eggs and then, you know, put exactly. them in the incubator all at the same time. So you get the same age of chick. And so that, that, that makes sense. But yep. I, I, you had told me that you went on the Bill's show, the Chameleon Academy to discuss this practice specifically. And, and to my surprise, you actually got a lot of pushback or you, you, you said you got a lot of pushback from Peter people. So what was some of the negative, like what was the, why are people offended by you speaking out against this? It seems very obvious. It, it is pretty obvious. I think that there's two different groups of people that kind of didn't like what I had to say about that. Um, one is people who want to breed and the way they see it is if they start with one egg versus 30 eggs that's that's good um and i think there's you know there's something to that um there's an the, the, i think that the clutch size that you get from a panther chameleon is is objectively too big like you you end up with a lot of babies and so their argument was hey it's good if i start with a single egg versus a huge clutch and I'm not prepared. I don't have the infrastructure, et cetera. And, um, I'm, I've, I've, I've kind of, when, if, if we do discuss it in more detail, I said, okay, well, that's why I think it's, it's better to, to do this with other breeders. If you're doing like a breeder to breeder exchange or you're doing it with somebody, you know, wants to breed, but 
general sales to the average pet owner, that's where that's where I have an issue. Is like it, those people who you're saying, well, they'll do their research during the time when the egg is incubating. If you're getting into that <laughs> yeah. side of the debate, then I'm like, okay, no, no, you're those the general public is different. If you're talking about people who are actually trying to skill, like upskill, you know, they're trying to gain these skills, they're trying to learn. That's different from the general sales, like that you do that you do to the public, and so um, that's one. And then the other is the um, I'd call them kind of the "don't tread on me" crowd. Like I can do what I want. Yeah. Um, they if you think I like you think you're better than me type of a thing, and it's kind of weird. It's like I don't think I'm better than anybody. I'm just start making an ethical argument, and the that that crowd gets frustrated when when. Um, when anybody makes an argument counter to what they're doing. Um, so I've that's, experienced that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's the, that's the other category of people where it's just like, no matter what you say, if you're going to talk about ethics, they're going to get uncomfortable and, and, and kind of fight against what you're saying. Whereas I think it's a really important conversation to have. And so I'm totally willing to deal with whatever blowback there is. Um, yeah. Well, it, it does seem important. I mean, it's definitely a good question. I mean, sh- is that something that we should be doing? I imagine that, well, A, it's a lot easier on the breeder to sell the eggs because then you're not raising yeah. babies. You don't have to worry about, you know, setting them up and, and whatnot. And h- how much cheaper is a chameleon egg than a, a hatchling? So it's a good question. It's cheaper up front. So usually the egg market, I've watched it for a couple of years now, is usually between about $140 and $200. Per egg, and most of the time, people are selling uh, juvenile, like three to four month old panther chameleon, between um, three hundred fifty and four hundred fifty dollars. So sometimes you're looking at like a hundred fifty dollars spread on the low and the high end of each of the markets, but um, on average, probably more like a two hundred dollars spread. It definitely costs more than two hundred dollars of food and. Uh, other expenses to get them to three months old, but people don't bake those costs into it. They, they're especially when it's an impulse buy, general public purchase, or an expo thing. Like people don't have the knowledge to be able to understand that that's actually not a good deal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, they think it's good, it's easy, and but yeah, and like you said, oh, I'll buy the egg and I'll go get the enclosure over the next couple of months while I'm waiting for this thing to hatch. And and yeah, it doesn't really make sense. So as far as for yourself, you know, getting into the the baby raising side, um, how are are you setting the babies up individually to make sure that you are able to you know withstand a giant a, a clutch of eggs in order to you know put them individually? So I think I'm now up to about a hundred and. 60 individual nursery enclosures. Um, and I've got it about at 50, 50, what I would call a sterile enclosure and bioactive enclosure with substrate and drainage and a bunch of different types of insects helping keep it in balance. I was, I'm trying to set up an experiment right now where I take a clutch and split it 50, 50 between the two methods and then weigh them throughout the process to get a sense for how the two methods differ Mm. um i haven't seen a difference that i can notice too 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 much but in the sterile strategy i've got vines and fake leaves and a clean bottom and the goal with those is essentially just to scrub it clean as frequently as possible whether that be every day when when you when they're when they're pooping in there or um every every other day and basically just the goal with those is keep them clean and um, make sure they all have their own environment, their own vines, their own places to drink and bask and all that. So they're getting everything that they need, but I, I would consider it sterile in that the goal is keep it clean. Whereas with the bios, it's about keeping it in a balance. Um, you're still going to go in and remove any extra poop if it's left over, but you're focused more on the plant plant health insects inside those enclosures and other things just trying to keep the whole thing um in balance and so i use both of those um, and how, how, how large are those those cubbies um six by 15 by 18 i think okay oh so actually pretty big yeah well, i'm i don't know i i think it could be bigger but um they grow fast <laughs> yeah yeah i guess so yeah they 
it, they're big enough for them from that that critical phase from zero to three months, possibly four, depending on the individual. And then, uh, and then I have a bunch of juvenile enclosures that I try to get them into from that point till about six, six to eight months or so. Is everything there? Uh, you know, we talked about the fogging system that you're kind of tinkering around with. I kind of want to get back to that in a second too. But as far as everything, yeah. as far as the misting, is the whole the baby wall as well as the adult wall is that all connected to a mister? Or are you going in by hand? It's all automated. Okay. Um, so I've got them on timers and their own dedicated like rack mister. Um, and that's part of what I'm trying to do with the fog is get that also automated. But um, how will you do that? Are you maybe we can chat a little bit about that? Because I think people are always curious about how to fog out an entire room. A, what are you going to use <laughs> as an ultrasonic fogger? And then B, how are you going to set up the infrastructure to, to be able to do that? Yeah. So PVC piping with mm-hmm. probably like House of Hydro discs in a DIY fogger is, is, is what I'm looking at right now. I have a, I use um, a three disc fogger for these, these four enclosures behind me. I imagine trying to do the whole room that the PVC is going to have some condensation and, and things like that. So it might even practically be better to just do one rack at a time, do a house of hydro, uh, just get, get, get enough discs and, and do one for each rack instead of having to try to transport it around using PVC. Um, but I, I'd probably talk to Craig. Durbin about that. If that he's he's done the most sophisticated stuff with fog that I've seen. Okay, cool. Maybe I'll, I'll make sure that his uh, his links are in the show notes. So people can go take a look. Because I'm, I'm yeah. as far as those DIY foggers go, you're just taking those hydro discs and they're they're sitting in a, a vat of water with a fan, or yeah. So you you take the they they have larger units, so where you get more discs, um, and so you pick the number of discs you want. Those float in the reservoir, and then you have. Uh, kind of an exhaust for the fog and then you have fan blowing into it so as the fog gets produced in the reservoir the fan blows in and the fog comes out the exhaust into the enclosure they're great because you can use any reservoir you want and um you 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 get to pick the specs basically but it's more it is more of a diy thing yeah well that i i'd stumbled across a few videos of people doing that just in greenhouses and whatnot and it seems like the most reasonable thing to do you know a because you can hold a lot more water you don't want to be changing that all the time do yep. you use distilled or ro water for for your fogger or yep you do okay yep I, either or do you generally use ro i'm sure you can make your yeah you make your own yeah RO. i have i have ro on my faucet down here <laughs> yeah that simplifies things yeah you discussed one of the points you'd, you'd mentioned to me was housing and uh, yeah. maybe I'll let you kind of run with that. I wasn't sure if you were discussing the baby's housing or just in general housing the adults as well. So maybe you can kind of jump into that topic. Yeah, I mean, on the on the adult side, I think what I I try to do is is do the best I can um, with my adult breeders, and I have the goal of essentially stretching their um, lifespan to the upper limits of like what we've seen in captivity. Um, and so that's part of my hobby. That's part of what I'm, what I'm doing is I want to provide that care for my adults to, to, to learn, um, and to continue to improve on that. So like Jude was my first holdback. Um, he's six years old now and I'd really like to get him into double digits. So that's kind of one of my main focuses. I keep a close eye on him. Um, but I haven't been breeding him for years i think the last clutch i did with jude was um 2019 okay somewhere in there so but jude is still a big focus of kind of what i do i and 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 so that i think is it's been my approach is i always enjoy there are certain chameleons that are just i I will say this is my this is a forever chameleon in my project he's going to be with me forever we're going to see how long how how long we can keep this going because because i really enjoy working with 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 them so um things like uh, he's got a he's got a giant ficus tree that just totally fills out his enclosure and i'll go and do a bunch of things making sure that he's um well hydrated and uh he he's he's actually one of the only chameleons that's up in the living space so he's there with the girls like my 
my my kids and and anybody who comes to see the house they're going to see him first um i think from a ethical standpoint it's to that point about like do you consider your breeders a pet jude's a pet like jude's Mm -hmm. definitely a pet at this point um and i think that from a housing standpoint um we should always be just continuing to learn so that we can share that with people who are going to end up with animals from us so if as a breeder i think part of our responsibility is that education piece um and and i see that as as a, essentially building the experience necessary to do the education yeah and you kind of want to lead by example in a way you don't it's nice that you can show off the enclosures that you have and how you're housing them to say this is a good standard to 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 work your way up towards without being the guy with you know chameleons shoved into small kind of plain enclosures with just basic lighting and whatnot, and then telling your customer to go out and do all this extra stuff. It's <laughs> yeah. sort of, it's kind of a hard sell in some ways. Yeah. And I, I used to do more expos before the pandemic. Uh, I used to do about a dozen or so a year. And I would just, the, the best thing I could hear from somebody at the expo was, are you selling plants? And I was yes. like, I have yeah. one today. Like yeah, today yeah, is yeah. a victory. So that was, that was generally how I approached it is I would come with fully planted enclosures, often, uh, it, you know, T5 lighting, LED bars, have a nice setup and really only bring six animals um, to the show in these enclosures. And uh, that's how I did expos. And I haven't been doing them lately just because of having our second child and um, the pandemic and so forth. It just hasn't made sense, but that's, and somewhat analogous to this, uh, like how do you keep your breeders? How do you how do you bring how do you bring things to people at the point of contact at a show? Like when you're gonna show off your animals, you should be able to educate them right there. Mm-hmm. And so that was part of what like my mindset was like. I want to make sure that I have everything right there. I don't need to. Uh, I can say this is the light you need. It's right in front of us. This is this is a plant that works really well, and point at it right in front of us. Have that conversation before they get. Uh, they walk up with with a panther. So, well, maybe that's more of the model that Expo should be going towards. You know, promoting the vendors to bring less animals. You know, you could bring a pamphlet or an iPad or something to show off the animals that you have at home to sell, but then really highlight the proper care of the thing that you're selling. You know, that's a totally different concept than we have right now with you know hundreds of deli cups and people walking in with absolutely no clue and then buying something because they like the way it looks in the deli cup without having an understanding of like, whoa, this is a huge enclosure. This thing has to keep, you know, living. I, I hate plants. I hate whatever it is. Yeah. You know, like you might learn some stuff just by looking at a fully set up enclosure and realize that you may or may not want that species. How large as, as far as housing goes, are you, do you recommend and, and what, what are you working towards? I would like to get to a place where I can do a minimum of four feet by two feet by two feet for an adult male. Um, I only have a few of those enclosures right now. Um, most of them are in two foot by two foot by four foot, um, kind of standard uh, XL Reptibreeze sizes. I think that probably even four foot by three foot by two foot would be ideal because they don't generally use that vertical space as much as they do the horizontal space. Um, so providing more horizontal space is 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 definitely a good goal. Yeah, that's my goal eventually is to try to get into more of like a four foot by two foot by two foot yeah, um, yeah. type situation. And then, you know, jumping back to the the lifespan, you know, question, that is one sad thing about panther chameleons is they tend to have a shorter lifespan. But how, it, it, do you think that's, I mean, obviously with the females, you're talking about laying eggs and, and, and you know, that, that could hurt their lifespan and whatnot. But do you think that the short lifespan is mostly due to just us not having a full grasp on caring for them? Like how, how long, yes. how far can we push it? Do you think? I, I think if we do a better job raising them, do a better job keeping them, then we'll start to see them be double digit basic, like the basic expectation for their life to be like 10, 12 years. And, and right now it's what, like six to eight is, is eight is like long, right? Yeah. Eight is, eight is like people are pumping their fists, you know, they they've succeeded. But I think that, Eight is is a great achievement, especially if an animal is coming to you in a, in in a rough sh- in rough shape. So they're already going to lose some some life expectancy in the beginning if something goes wrong, if they're group raised or or whatever it is. It's got to be 
two two things working together: the breeders raising them right, and then people providing everything that they need. Um, and then you're going to start to see that that max life expectancy be the norm. What do you think are some of those driving factors for either? Well, I guess the same question: either extending the life or shortening the life, like lack thereof, whatever it is. Is it is it just space? Is it you know? Is there any of those? Are they just kind of it's, a mix of everything? There's a lot of things. I think one is space, but humidity is big. Um, I don't know if you followed any of the guys that were over in Madagascar recently. Oh yeah, um, like live live streaming. But you could see how much they were sweating and how humid it was. Humidity, I think, is huge. I've focused on it over the past year to two years, like really trying to bring up the humidity in my enclosures while maintaining airflow. I see a huge benefit to that, making sure that they stay at the 50% humidity range and then they're up to close to 100% at night. That That's a huge factor. Um, the other thing I, I think is people are used to dealing with issues that come up earlier in life, like trying to make sure they're eating enough and getting the supplements they need to grow into an adult chameleon, but they're not great at recognizing the issues that come later, obesity, uh, gout, and other medical issues that come as they're getting into their adult years. And so I think that as we get better at dealing with those and educating people on, yeah, it's good, you, you can focus on making sure they're eating until they're full grown. And then once they're full grown, managing their weight and diet to make sure that they don't end up with any of these other health issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm sure diet really, and obesity probably plays a massive role in, in those short, shorter lifespans, as we see in most and many different species across the board in the reptile world. It's uh, pretty common. Yep. Why don't we discuss a little bit about genetics? Cause I think that's a fascinating part. That's something that you, you know, you already mentioned at the top of the show, some of the, you know, the, the polygenic traits as far as color goes, but it seems like you dive deep into that world more so than I see a lot of people, you know, a lot of people are just very basic when it comes to breeding. So, so uh, where has genetics always been something that's been just fascinating to you? And is that why you've sunk your teeth into it? Yeah. It's always been an interest of mine. And, uh, with panther chameleons, the the really cool thing about them as a species is that they're sexually dimorphic, but the traits that people are breeding for are mostly presented in the males. Mm -hmm. You have this generation in a female that's a totally like unknown. You don't know what traits she has because she's not going to show you. I found that immediately something that was really interesting. I was like, well, what what does she have? You know, like what is mm -hmm. what traits what what traits she, does she bring to the table? And the interesting thing is just even theoretically thinking about that. If you look at her father, that's only half of the puzzle. You still have that other mystery mother. And so every time you get another male, you're just getting half. You're just getting half and half. And you, right. you're digging. The more you dig, the you're like not satisfied with what you're finding. And so <laughs> that part, I, I really enjoyed just knowing like, wow, this is a tough problem. Like this is going to be, this is going to be interesting because of how hard it is. Then you layer on that, that they don't have any known like dominant, co-dominant, or recessive traits that determine their color, uh, where you can draw up a simple Punnett square. With this, it's all about distributions. So poly with polygenics, uh, polygenic traits, the way that those end up is you have uh, a distribution of color. So if you take uh, a, a red and a yellow chameleon, you put them together, it's almost like taking a red and yellow distribution, and you take them together and you see where they overlap. Mm -hmm. That mean outcome is is the is what you're going to get. You're not going to get very many reds or yellows. You're going to get a lot with both a and a mix. And um, that's that's what you layer on top of this sexual dimorph dimorphism, where you don't know what's in the female. Um, we also have this really interesting phenomena where you could actually end up with a female that's coming with yellow traits, a male that's coming with yellow traits. But because of the way that that distribution works, you could get something on the tail that's even more yellow than either of them. Just like you can with two children or like two parents where their children are taller than them. Right. Right. That's a polygenic trait. And so from a color standpoint, that's exciting to me because I'm like, wow, I could actually get something even more yellow than, than either of the animals that I have because of the way polygenic traits work. So then is there an opportunity to, like, do people do any line breeding in order to ex emphasize a color or is that actually impossible because the mother, you just don't know? Well, that, that's, the, that's the thing that I think is kind of interesting. A lot of people do try to line breed because of this. 
but they don't know what's in their females. Right. <laughs> so they're often so they're they're often lion breeding to no end. Um because you if you don't know what's in your female and then you line breed her, then you could potentially just end up with all the negatives and none of the benefits. Right. Um and that is what that's what I see more often than um people who like actually do all the research and understand their females really well, then you can find a totally unrelated female and combine her with a, a, a male to get a better outcome than anybody who's trying to line breed um, with diverse genetics instead of uh, line bred genetics. But it does promote a lot of this because of the laziness. I, I would call it laziness of like people they don't either they don't trust other people they don't know what's in the females, but they're like, I, but I know the sire and I don't know anything else. So I'm just going to breed the sire right back to that female. Right. And so it, I, I've, I, I would say it's more a function of laziness than anything that's inherently good about it. Yeah. And yeah. Laziness to the effect that they're not even willing to understand uh, just on the theoretical level, how, how it, the genetics will transfer rather, you know, they're just like skipping all the steps <laughs> and just getting right to, to the line breeding. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, the problem with polygenic distributions is it's led a number of people to conclude that you just can't know. Like it's impossible to know. The reality is you can know. And I've been trying to prove that by not only doing successive generations, maintaining the yellow body phenotype, but publishing every single animal from every single clutch in my past clutches section so that people can see what that distribution is for themselves. That's my goal. And so now I'm at six generations and every single past clutch is up there with pictures. So hopefully trying to prove the point that like you can do this without line breeding. And so are you um, just, you're just bringing yeah. in fresh, a, a fresh female, a fresh male and, and maintaining this, this color. So I'm bringing, I I've, this year is the first time where I'm going to probably be using my own because I have enough lines. I have enough, um, diversity going and generations to to do pairings where the first common relative is one of mine three generations back on both sides which is way further back than anybody else reports so right. yeah yeah um it i will be doing some of those pairings but yeah i've been able to produce the phenotype with diverse uh genetics many times and then sometimes when it doesn't work out um so there's a lot of variety in the males, then I just drop that entirely. I drop just drop the that line from the project because they're throwing off too much. You know, you're getting too too. They're, whatever they're carrying genetically, phenotypically, can just end up as a, a you know paint. You know, like a paint splatter. Exactly. Like you you look and you're like, okay, well, any female from that group is a total like it's totally random. I I if you get so much diversity in the males, all of her brothers you have a bunch of different outcomes and you say, okay, I can't breed any of those females because it could be that red one over there. <laughs> it could be the yellow one over here. It's not really uh, something that you can work with. In those, you can take a yellow male and work him in, but you can't really, really work with the females. And then, so as far as the different localities of panther chameleons go, is, is, is that mainly just, like I'm very unfamiliar with them, is that mainly just co separated by color? Obviously there's a location in Madagascar and whatnot, but is it color that gives you the indicator? It's a it's a big part of it. Okay. But within each local form there's still local diversity of color and traits. Say you're working with Ambelobe, the body color ranges from yellow to red to green to orange in that spectrum. The bars tend to be blue to red and and that's that's what you get in that local form. When you go to somewhere like Nosy Folly, then you're going to end up with more white to sky blue bodies with blue bars, some red red rain speckles and things like that within every local form there's there's a kind of a local diversity is how i, was, I would call it but you can't take it one to one there's a decent amount of overlap so right. for example like yellow body if you get a yellow body chameleon it could be mitzio it could be diego suarez could be simbava could be voimar could be ambelobe just that one trait by itself doesn't um help you uh, determine its locale. Gotcha. Yeah. So you sort of need to look at the constellation of traits in order to, to pinpoint it. And I'm, sh I probably don't even want to ask this question, but are people mixing locales yeah. when they come? Yeah, it happens, right? 
Oh, it happens a lot. Um, and it's, it's also a function of this, the fact that it's, they're sexually dimorphic. So when females come in labeled as one locale or as an, or, or another, you won't know until her, her male offspring hatch out. And even then you might not know because if she was Simbava and you paired her with an Ambalobe, the look to, to, to be able to determine if it's, if she was Ambalobe or Simbava would be impossible. There, yeah. There's like two people in the United States who might notice the difference and most people aren't going to notice. And so those are going to get crossed a lot. There's a lot of situations like that. Yeah. Which is no surprise in, in our hobby, but it is kind of sad when you, you know, it's nice to keep things separate and, and, you know, especially when it comes, I could just imagine somebody's trying to mix colors and think that, you know, you could take one locale with another locale and create something that no one's ever seen before. And it probably never works out, but it, other than muddying up the genetics. There's some interesting combinations I've seen. Um, but most of the time you can tell a cross animal, it looks like it's trying to be two things at once. And mm -hmm. so um, often there's like clashing traits and things on them, which just doesn't look as nice. But yeah, I think that that's part of why we did the crowdfunding of the genetics locale experiment uh, at the beginning of this past year. Um, because we wanted to help with exactly this problem of can you know what a female's locale is or a male's locale is based on their genetics. Um, and so most of the way it worked and still does work is based on trust. It's, do you trust the importer? Do you trust the breeder, their reputation? So if they they have a good reputation, people are going to trust them mm -hmm. um, and trust their locale designations, even if they're wrong. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. that, that that is the part that it's like okay well it we need to have some other piece of information to uh bring into that that conversation and uh improve the the our understanding of local forms and and be able to determine what they are and, and did that work were, were you guys able to find certain genetic markers that separates the local forms yeah especially on the mtdna portion of it the mitochondrial dna that comes from your mother right uh doesn't get combined when reproduction occurs. So you know that it traces directly to your mother and her mother and, and on from there because it doesn't get mixed up every time reproduction right. occurs. Yeah, it's so clean. Those, yeah. yeah, it's more clean. They're working on the nuclear DNA portion of it right now. Um, Rare Genetics Inc. Uh, Benson Morrill is the, is the guy who's, who's doing most of the R&D. That's cool. I love to hear stories like that. You know, taking, uh, it's just one of those things that her pediculturists can be quite, you know, serious when it comes to certain things like this. And, you know, if it wasn't for us wanting to know this information, it might never have happened. So it's pretty cool that uh, we can dig into that and actually come up with a cool answer. Yeah. I mean, it was an old paper that they were trying to make an argument that these local forms were actually separate species. Because that was one of the ethical considerations of doing cross locale pairings is are you actually creating a hybrid between these two species? And so that paper was trying to answer that question. I don't think they did that very well, but what they did do is create this great database of genetic information with uh, local like geo geocodes for where they took that sample. And so we had over 300 samples of DNA and MTN, mtDNA with uh, geospatial, geospatial information, right? So we could then say, this is in Ambalobe, this is in Mbanja, and go around, take those samples, and, and then see that there's actually genetic markers in those locations that you don't see anywhere else. So they're unique to that location. A lot of these mutations take like between 500 and 1,000 generations to occur. So it means that those populations haven't mixed for a very long time because the, the, especially on the mtDNA side, as I was saying, it's stable. Um, yeah. yeah. It's pretty stable. And so if you see there's a 20 mutation separation between Ambalobe and Mbanja, then you know that those two guys have not crossed the river uh, in a long time. Right. So um, that's, that's the type of thing that that helps you answer because there was a lot of rumors of, 
like these populations actually do interbreed in the wild. And that paper was answering that question, saying that actually, no, they don't. They stay separate and the genetic um, information is there for us to essentially prove that they don't mix and then we can use it in a genetics test to determine the animal that you have, what what markers do they match in the wild. Well, that kind of leads us nicely into the topic of importing and, and wild-caught animals coming in. Is that a still a major source of, of new animals or is, is captive breeding taking on a lot of it or are we still getting lots of wild-caught animals coming into the trade? We still have a decent number of wild-caughts um, coming in. And I, this is the first year that I, I acquired some wild cots. I had been watching the industry for six years to the point, but before I decided to do it myself, essentially saying like, I'm not going to get it from this distributor, that distributor and picked one that I was comfortable with because they, they do a good job. The animals tend to come in in better condition. And they they are engaged in conservation and other things. So I was like, okay, they're doing a better job um, than the average for sure. And I felt comfortable with with that. But um, yes, there are imports every year um, from different locales. Within different locales, one of the reasons I like Ambalobe is because there's enough of them in captivity to not warrant uh, like wild caughts for a while because mm-hmm. there's there's so many ambalobe panthers that you actually can work with them as a breeder build a project and not have to ba- bring in a wild caught whereas with some of the smaller more rare local forms you get to a place very quickly after one or two pairings where you have to bring a wild caught in for genetic diversity because there just aren't that many right um in the united states so that was one of the things that did sway me from working with some of the other locales was that I didn't want to work with wild cots um, until I felt like I was prepared to do them justice. And uh, like I had spent time learning how to do fecals, learning how to do, how to treat various parasitic infections, how to do quarantine, the consequences of not doing quarantine. Um, you know, you run, run down the list of all the things you need to know to be able to, deal with a wild caught properly. Um, I felt like I was there and I was, I felt like I was prepared. So then I, I decided to do it. And, and was it Ambalombe that you brought in? Yep. And uh, yep. How, what was your experience with them? Were they hard to get started or were they, was it, was it a challenge? Um, yeah, they were definitely more challenging than any, uh, Panther I had acquired before. Um, I set them up in an, in nice big enclosures outside far away from anything else. And then um, I made sure that they were getting lots of mist, lots of water, trying to give them more isolation. I didn't want to stress them out by looking in every day. So I was giving them more uh, you know, time to adjust. And even with all the extra work that I put into their enclosures and their hydration and uh, everything, I still lost two of five. I would, I would say that's... That's pretty good, um, yeah. Based on what I've heard from other people, it's very challenging. And uh, you know, I can. I was pissed. Like I was really, I was really disappointed. And um, when I lost Dia, it was one of the one of the wild cots that I brought in. And I was already starting like two 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 months in. I was already starting to have all sorts of plans for him. But um, you know, it didn't. He didn't. He didn't make it. So I I think that one thing that I learned about that process was just like it really is something for people who are more advanced. Um, and if, if somebody is getting their first chameleon, they, they absolutely shouldn't even have access to it. In my opinion, like it, yeah. it's, it's, uh, it just doesn't make sense. Cause the, the, the chance of them like successfully acclimating a wild caught is just so low. The thing that pushed me to, to try it was simply because, uh, I, work on this yellow body, yellow, yellow body, blue bar phenotype. And I had added all the lines I was aware of <laughs> into my project. And so You're out of lines, <laughs> yeah, I was, I had run out. I had acquired basically everything, um, that I knew of, uh, in the United States. And then I also have a standard as far as 
how closely related I want to do pairings. And, and, and that was forcing me to say like, okay, well, I, I actually now need to add some of my own lines because um, I couldn't, couldn't find anything else out there. But when you do import, are are you able to look at what animals you're importing? Because now if you're trying to, you know, get that yellow body, blue bar phenotype, you're looking for males with that, right? Yeah, you're looking for males with that. And I do have one female that I'm proving out. And so, I'm, you know, if she if I hit on a yellow with her, uh, then I'll be ecstatic. But I'm not expecting it. Um, and so, yeah, the males... I did get a chance to take a look at them before okay. um, making that decision. But I think you're right. I think it's a good point talking just about wild caught in general. It, it, someone like yourself who's super thorough and uh, a fairly advanced keeper and still struggling with them, if any of those wild caught animals are ending up in the hands of a new keeper, it's literally just a sale for the importer and a death sentence for the animal. Yeah, it's probably fair. Yeah, which is sort of and, sad. Yeah, no, it is. It's not it's not a good thing for sure. And there's a, a lot of challenges with that, right? It's like for them to s- stay in business in some ways they need to do these, these sales. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause otherwise they're not going to like, they're not going to have a breeder willing to spend $4,000 per animal because they can't sell their animals. So like, I think the economic piece of it is, is part of where that challenge comes from in that the expenses of importing, um, they have to do larger volume than the market can sustain. Uh, the, the breeder market can sustain. Right. And so that's, I think that's the, one of the challenges we need to figure out how to solve. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And getting back to the, you, you mentioned parasites and whatnot with the wild cut animals. Yeah. You, you have an interesting blog post on your website about, you know, parasite screening and whatnot with with those wild caught animals were they did you screen them and were they f- pretty full and and what did you do from that step well i actually got lucky because i only had um a few nematodes and and coccidia in the wild caught that i got i didn't have anything like filarial worms where you have to do surgery um and they're in their blood and 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 all their organs and things like that um so the the parasites that I had in my wild caught were parasites I'd seen before, mm-hmm. um, and so I had the drugs on hand. I had already identified them in fecals before. Uh, there were a few that were kind of tricky because there were different species of coccidia that I hadn't seen before. So like Imeria versus Isospora. If anybody's a parasite nerd, um, <laughs> there were different species of coccidia that I hadn't seen, and I've gone gone down the rabbit hole on that. I, I want to I want to try to write it up as a part of that parasite series. I was able to treat them after hydrating them, after homeopathic remedies, after feeling like they were ready so they could actually be treated and and be treated successfully. And uh, Bibby's in this one right here. He's one of my wild cots, um, and he's been giving me clean fecals for for months now, um, and so uh, he's doing very well. And I, it's like, I'm very proud of him. You know, he's, he's important. So he's, yeah. he's got that, that enclosure right there. So. And are, are you pretty strict with doing fecals on, on most of the collection on a periodic basis? Yeah. In 2020, I set the goal of doing a fecal on every animal in my room. And so I laid out a spreadsheet. I have all the, had all the enclosures on the spreadsheet and just went, cage by cage doing fecals the entire year until I'd gotten them all at least two fecals. And then if I found any positives, uh, treated until I got negatives, it was a ton of work. It was a lot of like late nights, uh, just breaking out my microscope and doing, you know, like batches of 20 fecals and then putting the data in there and then just kind of keeping just working through the room that way. And what I, what I learned from that was that a lot of parasitic infections don't present any pathogenic signs like you don't see anything um but they're positive in the fecal i also tested all the animals i acquired that were captive bred and more than half of them were positive for something Mm -hmm. um and that was before i had any wild caught so it's just in within the captive population and and so so is your opinion that everything should be 
you should get everything to a clean status as far as as their parasite load or you know or is it a never ending or a never winning battle i mean it's a the drugs are hard on them right um and if the parasitic infection is not pathogenic i think that you should and it's, and, you, and you just have one or two animals you're not worried about contagion um then in that situation you can be more conservative in your your decision to treat because if they're healthy the drugs might kill them right and so you just have to understand that that risk is real and so um that decision is something that i i feel like a vet is is very well positioned to help you with but my in in my situation where I have over a hundred animals, I'm worried about contagion, uh, and so I'm going to lean more towards treating than someone who only has one or two. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. It really has to do with your own the setting of your own collection. Whether you only have yep. one or if you have a massive collection, it makes more sense to go pretty hard. Exactly. Or if you're planning to have them in a sterile environment versus a bioactive environment, that's important. If you want to get them into a bioactive environment, you want a clean fecal. That's you. You do not want a healthy animal going into a bioactive environment with a positive fecal because they won't be healthy long term. Right. So, and that's a huge piece of bioactive uh, keeping that I think uh, is ne- is neglected. And so people bit blame bioactive for it when they put an animal with a parasite in a bioactive environment. And that is definitely going to go south. Um, yeah, that's it's so true. And you never hear about that being the first step before adding an animal to a naturalist or you know bio, a bio bioactive setup. Is if you do that and you add an animal in with a parasite load, you're just creating a breeding ground forever. Exactly. And you can and never get rid of it without completely no, dismantling you, you it. You totally tear it out, and it's yeah, it's a nightmare. I've I've had it happen, um, and had to learn. But I think that that um, is a key piece of doing that, using that strategy correctly is making sure you've got clean fecals before you even think about it. Mm. Yeah, that's a fantastic point. I think that's actually a point I've never come across at all before. So that's, I think that's a thing for people to add to their toolkit, you know, get a clean fecal before you add to the, the you know, the, the forever enclosure or whatever you end up doing. Yeah. So one of the last points that I, I know you wanted to talk about was just the sort of the production rate and the amount of breeders we have. And we'll talk about flipping as well. Cause I think that's a kind of an interesting side to herpeticulture. Yeah. That's a, maybe not the best, but as far as production rate goes, uh, do we have too many people producing or, or what's the story with, with chameleons? Yeah, I think so. Mm-hmm. For me, there's not enough of what I want, but that's because I I have very specific things that I enjoy about the species, and I'm going for a specific look, the the specific phenotype within a specific locale. It's pretty it gets the niche thing, um, but the species as a whole, there's a lot of what I would consider just like random pairings that have been done, and then it's very difficult for people to find homes for those because they see the dollar signs on a like one of the top options in the country and they they see that as the potential for their breeding project when the random pairings are overdone um so that market is totally saturated and the prices of those animals are 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 and the uh, the ability for the market to actually adequately take care of those animals is just not there. One of the things I think is really interesting about this problem though, is when, when you talked about it on your, your, your podcast, the, the issue of overproduction, there's a lot of people out there that almost create a market for what they do, right? Like I feel like Frank Payne is a great example. He'll get a species and before he's offering it to anybody, he's doing all these really cool marketing bits on that species. And like, I find myself going like, Oh man, I want that now. Yeah. And, and he creates a market for what he's doing, um, which which is awesome. So even I, which is so overproduction is one thing. I think the other side of it is the breeder taking responsibility for that legwork, right? Like 
do you market what you're working on so that when you're done, people are there waiting for you so that you can work with them and make sure that what you're doing has a place. Whereas if you think that you can, like regardless of what it is you breed, if you think you can just pair some stuff up and by the time they're ready for homes, you can just throw them up on morph market and it's going to work out for you. It's That's not going to work, right? Mm-hmm. And so I, when I hear overproduction, I'm like, well, there's, a, there's, two, there's two sides to that. One is the supply and the other is the demand. And if you can help create the demand, if you can be involved with that part of it, then you can produce those, right? Um, and that's the way I always think about it is overproduction in some ways is like you're contributing to the supply without doing anything on the demand. Yes. Like you're not helping to increase the demand for what you do and you just expect the market to absorb it. I think that that's irresponsible, right? I think that um, the way that n- we have the internet now, I know when I bred cooler breeds, it was before the internet and you had nothing but your local market to figure out how to find homes for your animals back then. It was Reptiles Magazine reptile showcase down the road and like whoever i knew at church that was like how is it how i was going to find places for my snakes right and today there's so many ways for you to get out there and talk to people um and find people who are in alaska or you know whatever it is find people who have a similar passion to you and then help make sure that um what you're doing has has a place in the market so yeah i really i I really love that idea of helping drive the demand because you're right the breeders will you know that's where we do get into these over over stimulated or over supply issue is because we have people just breeding without actually assessing whether there's demand in the market and a lot of times the animals end up into a rescue situation so they kind of go through an impulse purchase and into a rescue so sometimes the breeder might not even be realizing that the demand is actually low because it goes through a middleman first before it ends up as you know in a place where nobody wants it which is sort of sad but i think that's such a cool idea is is kind of driving demand for the product that you're creating i mean that is the side of the business that you want to be interacting with and if you are somebody who's you know crossbreeding locales and whatnot, you know, that's not a great product. You, 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 it's going to be hard to create demand for, hey, do you want a genetically poor animal? You know, it's not a great selling pitch. So it sort of forces the breeder to take more, you know, ownership over what they're doing. Yeah. And and if you are going to do crosses, make sure there are people who like it. Like <laughs> yeah. you can, you, I, I, I personally don't have anything to, like, I don't think there's anything wrong with it ethically speaking, as long as you can find a, you know, 30 people who want those animals um, and you can explain to them why you did it and, and why they should want it. Right. That, and that's what I tell people all the time with, with when they, they are coming to me and they're like, Hey, would this be a good pairing? I want this female from this pairing. They're like, well, what are you trying to do? Like, what's mm-hmm. your goal? Can you articulate that to me? Cause you're going to have to do that 30 more times. So like that, that's to me is the key piece, no matter what you're doing. Um, you have to articulate your goal so that other people can agree with you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, and you're such a great example, right? You're working with this, this phenotypic trait, this yellow body, blue bar, and you have all of the uh, generational data to show how diverse it is. It's not becoming this like inbred thing with the blue, whatever. And that is a, incredibly appealing to somebody who A, loves the way the animal looks, but also is really wanting an animal with solid genetics and that's yep. a selling feature. Now you have a demand, you know, you don't need to find 30 people at church. You can find 30 people across the, the United States who are really interested in that and you can sell out, you sell your clutch out. That's, that's my perspective on it. And I think I had seen some of the work that Frank was doing when I, when we got our new place and I've been following him ever since he's, he's, he's a person I have a lot of respect for. Yeah. 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 He's great. He, and he, you're, like you said, he, he does create a market and he does a great job of showing what is amazing about each species and why it's fascinating to keep them. And I think that's a huge part of it too. Like sh- show off the behaviors that you're going to see if you keep, if you do end up purchasing this hatchling or this neonate, here's some of the things you can expect in the next year or so, not just this is what the animal looks like and, you know, take, take it home. And, yeah. and, and as far as flipping goes, is that something that, I mean, I know this happens a lot in reptile world as far as, you know, just people buying things secondhand and immediately selling. Is that a particularly an issue in chameleon world or, or is it just the same old? I I think it is particularly an issue with chameleons because of their clutch sizes. Mm. So Panthers have so many babies and not only that, 
but the retained clutch comes before the first clutch is ready to go. So even just one pairing, you can you need 60 cages. Wow. And and nobody has 60 cages. No. But they do pairings and then they have to wholesale off most of their animals because they're starting to hurt each other. Um, you know, gouging each other's eyes, biting off each other's tails and stuff. And they're starting to get worried. And so then they find a flipper, they find a wholesaler and they, they try to get as many of them out as they can because they can't manage it, right? There's something about the species itself that makes it more common because of the fact that you're going to get 30 babies and then 60 days, you're going to get 30 more. And that's just one pairing. That's one, that's like, that, that's just the base expectation if you're going to work with the species. It's a far cry from eight ball pythons. Yeah, it is. And that you could keep in, you know, if you had them in a rack, theoretically, you know, you could keep them in a small space. You're not dealing with 60 actual enclosures for baby chameleons. Yeah, where you need misting and you need foliage, you need all this, like the the fact that it's already an advanced species to begin with. Um, and then you have to try to scale that to, to accommodate the whole clutch. Because of that fact, it makes them more of a challenge and more likely to end up in a flipping type situation, wholesaler. Uh, market. So if, if somebody is interested in buying a chameleon, what are some things that you think that they should inquire with their breeder about? Or, or how can somebody tell if they're getting their animal from a source that is somebody like yourself that's conscientious about what they're doing and making sure they're you know acting the right way? Well, I get people all the time asking if they can just FaceTime me. Mm. And, and I do that pretty frequently. So like somebody will say, hey, can I FaceTime you? Are you in the reptile room? I'm like, yeah. Like, FaceTime and then turn it around, show everybody the room. That's and then cool. they'll be like, I'm interested in this animal. I'll take them right over to the cage where it is. Um, and the same for the breeders that are in the, like the enclosures behind me or on the wall over here. Um, they're welcome to see whatever they want to see. So I think that that's important. Um, if, if the breeder is, is hesitant, then that's uh, uh important information that they should take into account when, when they're making a purchase. Um, I, I think that some of the old school mentality is like there's trade secrets or something that they don't want to share and they tend to be more secretive, uh, just by default. But I think a lot of the newer breeders, especially are more transparent. They're more open to, to just sharing what they, what they're doing. Well, I, I know I know one of the complaints with breeders is you get flooded with simple questions and the same question over and over and people that don't do the research and then are asking you like basic care questions and it's sort of frustrating. But I imagine that how you display yourself on social media or, or you know how you display your business, you probably attract certain customers, right? Like maybe you get beginners, but I'm sure you're the beginners you're getting are people that actually have a pretty deep understanding already of chameleon care. They're not coming to you and saying, you know, is what what species is this type situation? No, no. I I I actually am. I love sometimes the beginners will come to me and they have this like amazing enclosure set up, and and I I really do enjoy that. Like just seeing that they've already kind of like self selected um, to some degree. Mm-hmm. And I've had this conversation with people before where I say like some people will say, "Oh, you're going to get fewer sales if you do X, Y, and Z because you're going to scare certain people." like they should be scared like I'm not, <laughs> yeah like, i'm not i'm not i'm not concerned about that like yeah you know if if they get scared they should be you know and they should go somewhere else yeah it filters out those people that aren't willing to do the basic research and so that to me is like hey if we intimidate the right people then that's not going to bother me at all um cuz i'm not interested in trying to scale the project i'm interested in learning building it the way that i want to build it and doing the thing that I'm interested in. If it scales, it scales. And it does scale naturally just because there's certain questions that I, I still want to answer. And um, I, that, that's been my approach is like, hey, if, if there's something that's the correct thing to do that the market may respond negatively to, doesn't matter. It's like you, you just do it. And yeah. ev- eventually people start to recognize that and you get the right customers. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You get to you sort of curate or foster the type of customer. That's the type of person that you'd be happy to sell an animal to, not somebody that when you send it, you're kind of wondering whether or not that animal is going to live. 
Exactly. Yeah. Well, Jonathan, I loved this conversation. It flew by. We've already been talking for almost 90 minutes and I think we covered a lot here. Is there anything that we didn't mention that you wanted to, to close off on? No pressure either way, but if, if there's anything that we left out that you wanted to say, you can go for it. Um, no, I think we covered a lot, man. Yeah. Yeah. We really did. Uh, I, I love your model. I love your mindset. I think just thinking about things in a, almost like a clinical way, like you're very precise with what you do. I know, I know that, you know, your day job obviously probably has similar things that, you know, crossover as far as just being precise and, and data driven, but I think that's what we need. And I think that that's important to, to cover people like yourself. Can you let everybody know where they can find your website and, and uh, Instagram and whatnot? Sure. It's a uh, iperdallas.com. And then uh, Iperdallas on Instagram, Iperdallas on Facebook, and uh, I put a lot of effort in the website. Uh, it's one. It's another thing that I enjoy is is just kind of like documenting everything. Um, so I hope other people can appreciate that too. So yeah, absolutely. I I know there are some people out here that will. I mean, I love looking through it too, but people who are really into the chameleon side will absolutely be mind blown by it because you've really done a lot of data collection and, and laying out everything for everybody to, to thoroughly understand. So thank you so much for all the work that you're doing. And thank you very much for joining me on the episode of the podcast. This was fantastic. Thanks, Dylan. All right. That is the end of that episode. Jonathan, thank you so much for jumping on the podcast. It was a, a very insightful episode. I think there was at least five or six points that I've not heard before on the podcast, which is super important. I think bringing new information to the show is so key. And I love the way you care for the animals. And I love the way you go about your breeding operation. It's so thorough and conscientious, which is the type of breeder we want to be promoting in our hobby. It's the type of breeder we want new breeders to be learning from. And anyway, I had a blast chatting with you listeners. I'm sure you really enjoyed the episode as well. If you did enjoy it, the easiest thing you can do is share it on social media. Let's bring some new listeners and some new viewers to the podcast. That really does help support the podcast. And if you are interested in helping monetarily, you can do that over at patreon.com slash animals at home. Thank you so much to Custom Reptile Habitats. You can check them out in the show, uh, the show notes. It has a link, an affiliate link, as well as the YouTube description. And again, if you do make a purchase through that link, a small commission comes back to me at no extra cost to you. If you are looking for any Animals at Home t-shirts or sweaters, you can do that at animalsathome.ca. That's the end of this episode. Thank you guys so much for tuning in, and I cannot wait to share the next one with you. I will see you then.